This is Gwen Talks, where intimate conversations reveal, heal, inspire, and entertain. And now, here's your host, Tess Cacciatore. Hello again. Here we have Dr. Patrick Porter. I'm so excited to have him here today. He's going to share with us intimate details on how we can find inner peace within with the product lines that he has, but also just significant tools that we all need in every day to reduce our stress. Welcome, Dr. Patrick Porter. How are you? Well, it's great to be here. Thank you. Doing well. Absolutely. So we just got done seeing the Gwen Luminary Awards. How do you feel about receiving the Gwen Luminary Award this year for the work you're doing? Well, it's quite an honor, and um, I'm appreciative that uh, people are finding results with uh, BrainTap. I'm excited to dive into that, and we will, of course. But I've been asking all the recipients this year, what was your main inspiration? Like, where did you grow up, and what was your first entry into this kind of passion? Well, my dad was a chronic alcoholic. We grew up in Battle Creek, Michigan. And actually, the church founders came over. The Father Fitzpatrick and Sister Mary came over and said, hey, Michael, we're going to teach you how to de-stress. So they took him to a seminar at the church to help him to learn how to do some deep breathing and relaxation techniques. And that led him to become a seminar leader in something called the Silva Method, which uses um, what they call the Silva Sound, which got me into the sound part of the light and sound that I work with. What is this silver sound? And by the way, was this a, a Catholic church or what kind of religion? Yes. Yeah, it was a Catholic church. And uh, Jose Silva was um, a member of the Catholic church, but he was in Laredo, Texas. But uh, my dad became a, one of the first presenters. So I, I grew up actually going every other weekend around lower Michigan and helping my dad set up seminars and helping people how to deal with their stress back in the 70s and 80s. And then in, in 85, I went to work for a company called Light and Sound Research. And we married the two when the microchip came out. Uh, we started being able to use LED lights to mimic the effects of a candle. Most people don't understand that a candle actually emits a 10 hertz frequency, which happens to be alpha to the brain. And every cell of our body has something called mirror neurons. So we now know something called epigenetics and science that basically our environment influences the way our body shows up uh, genetically. So we have our genetics, of course, like my hairline came from my dad and my, and my mom, you know, through our genetics. And then, uh, but there's certain things that they know that 99% of who we are changes actually every 40 seconds based on everything you could think of from the foods we consume to the thoughts we think to the environment we live in. All of that plays a role in how our body shows up because our body is always, a, we, we have an adaptive nervous system, but we really have an adaptive full system. Every cell is adapting all the time to its environment. For instance, if we go outside and it's cold, we'll begin to shiver to warm up our body. If we go outside and it's hot, we'll begin to sweat. This is all part of our adaptive system, and it's all based on genetics. Well, first off, there's a lot to unpack there. I can't wait to do so. But I first have to say what an important milestone that you had as a child. I grew up in the Catholic Church as well. And so, of course, where I was raised in the Midwest, too, in Des Moines, Iowa, there was always, mm -hmm. you know, more of the stricter side of the Catholic Church. And I got my breathing techniques doing yoga with mommy and me yoga <laughs> with my mom. So the, it's so wonderful that that um, Father Silva, is that his name? Jose Silva was his Jose name. Jose Silva. So he wasn't yeah. a priest at the church. No, not Father, Father Fitzpatrick was the priest. In, oh, Father and Fitzpatrick. Gary, they, would, they would actually put on the seminars, and then my dad took over for them, actually, when they couldn't do it. And we started doing them every other weekend around Lower Michigan. Yeah. That's fantastic. I love that. I hope that every church and school adapts these kinds of tools that's really important for everybody on the planet but specifically i'm sure the children are really experiencing a lot of stress between being locked down in COVID and the wars that are going on in the world and seeing that there's children of their age that are around the world that have a uh, significant stress going on um I want to unlock that piece of it first, and then I want to dive in more into the science side of it. So you use mm -hmm. a lot of multi-syllable words that, that I would love to learn about, and I'm sure our viewers would as well. So tell us about what, um, what the importance of the breathing techniques as a child, and what would you give them as a recommendation to do so, and, and their parents and family alike. Yeah. Well, number one, my dad didn't realize he was drinking to reduce stress. 
He, mm -hmm. he didn't, or he kind of thought that, but he didn't know any other way. He didn't have a good solution. So he'd go, obviously, just drink to the point where he wasn't thinking anymore. And then, of course, his thoughts would stop and his stress would lower. But then he'd wake up and, of course, the cycle would begin again. But what we know is that breathing is basically linked to our emotions. All negative emotions have one thing in common, lack of breathing. So if you think of anger, fear, frustration, anxiety, there's lack of breath. And so if you can think of breath as kind of the button that pushes the emotional trigger, you can we've all known children that come running up to you and they're angry and you say, just breathe, just breathe. And they get angrier because they know as soon as they breathe, the anger is gone. Right. So if we, but if we can learn to breathe, so there's three core techniques that I'd love to teach the, the people here. They're very easy to do. Well, in the morning, we need to wake up our brain in primitive times. Of course, we didn't have coffee like we do today to wake our brains up and synthetically do it. We would, we would actually wake up in neuroprenephrine and cortisol and these things that happen when we wake up in the morning that wake our brain up. So we can use a breathing technique, which they actually call the breath of fire which is a, just a, basically you keep your mouth shut, but you breathe as quickly as you can through your nose and you do it in cycles. So you, you do go like something like this and you're just breathing out, but you, you do it to the point where you're, you lose your breath because you're going to find out eventually you're going to run out of air doing that unless you practice it. <laughs> I, I know breath of fire through Kundalini yoga. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. And I studied for five years with Yogi Bhajan in, in uh, oh, Arizona wonderful. as part of my training. And so that breath wakes up the brain. We call it digital coffee in the, in the app brain tap because we do some exercises like this. We have over 200 sessions just for breathing out of our 2000. So 10% of our app is all about breath. So that wakes up the brain. And if you do that naturally, what happens is now you have clear thinking, more energy, more vitality. Now, in the middle of the day, most people don't realize also that our body is tuned to the light of the sun. Some people call it the circadian rhythm, right, in, in science. But at 2 o'clock, everybody's temperature drops 2 degrees. That's why they run out and get coffee, tea, and chocolate around 2 o'clock. But what we really need to be doing is either doing some form of relaxation, mindfulness technique, breathing technique. So the breathing technique I recommend in the middle of the afternoon is called box breathing. And I always tell people, if it's good enough for the Navy SEALs, it's good enough for you. you know, <laughs> do you sound like breathe. a SEAL when you're doing it? How do you do it? <laughs> yes. So the, the Navy SEALs, which is an elite um, you know, military group, what they would do is on the way to deployment, of course, you're going to have some anxiety and fear come up because even, no matter how tough you are, you know, you're going into battle. So what they would do is the box breathing is very simple. You'd breathe into the metal count of four. You hold that count to four. You breathe out to four. And then you leave it out for four. That's the box, right? And you continue that process. Maybe start off with just two minutes of it. Then go to five minutes of it. I even tell people that have high anxiety, do this while you're driving. When you get stopped at a stoplight, this is your chance to do some breath work. And so what that will do is it will actually upregulate your parasympathetic system. There's two systems in the nervous system that we need to regulate for stress reduction. Most people are stuck in what's called sympathetic drive, which is our fight or flight response. So they go to sleep, they clench their teeth, they wake up, they're tired, and, and they're anxious when they wake up in the morning because they really didn't get sleep because they didn't unlock their nervous system. And I'm going to tell you that one in just a moment. But we need to, three, three times during the day seems to be the magic equation to keep the body in a flow state. Our body works best during flow. So then at night when you're going to sleep, what I always recommend is what they call a 4-8 breath. And when you breathe into the count of four, you're going to notice that you're going to trigger your sympathetic. You might have a little fear, a little anxiety show up. And that's perfectly fine. Part of mindfulness teaches us don't try to avoid it. Be present with it for a moment. But then when you breathe out to the count of eight and you connect that breath, so there's no pauses here like there is in the box breath. So you breathe into four, you breathe out to eight. And as you breathe out to eight, you're going to find a release happening uh, and we, that's the parasympathetic system coming online. The parasympathetic system is our rest, relax, and digest system. And, and when you're doing that, what we find is after you do about four or five breaths, pretty soon you're going to find that your body's pretty relaxed. Now you're going to do, while you're breathing in and breathing out, continue that four, eight breath, you scan your body, a body scan right before sleep. And while you're doing that body scan, think of it three or four things during the day that you're grateful for. It could be simple things like, I'm grateful for the award. You know, that would be something that would be, that I would think about tonight, of course, when I'm going to sleep. I would be 
visualizing that. I'm grateful for my grandkids. I'm grateful for my wife. You know, whatever you're grateful for, you bring that into your mind because they science has shown that if you go to sleep thinking of things you're grateful for, your sleep is going to be deep. You're going to have more rest, more relaxation, more rejuvenation. And this is one way to unlock the brain, especially if you don't have technology like brain tap. I mean, if you have brain tap, then you can do the brain tap sessions, but a lot of people can't afford that. In between that time, the best thing you can do for stress reduction is make sure you're drinking half your body's weight in ounces of water. Most people don't realize that a lot of the problems they have with their body is dehydration. With, with now more people drinking sodas or coffees or teas all day long, and herbal tea is pretty good. You can usually, if you don't like drinking just regular water, drink some herbal tea or you know get some stevia or something like that and put it in your water. But water is what our body needs most. So you know those are some things you can do to really help out with that stress reduction. Amazing techniques. I do want to tap into, pun intended, um, the 40 second that you recreate yourself every 40 second. Can you dive into that a bit? That sounded very right. intriguing to me. Yeah. Back in 2003, you know, we all heard, uh, if you were alive at that time, listen, <laughs> they, you, they said, right, we mapped out the human genome, right? We all heard about that. But the reality was they only mapped 1%. So could you imagine passing your, your school exams and you only pay, you only answered one question. You said, hey, I passed my school exams. It wouldn't happen. That's because the other 99% of our gene expression was moving and changing so quickly they couldn't map it. In 2018, they realized that that 99% changes every 40 seconds. They call it epigenetics now. So it's what, it happens above genetics. So it's what triggers our genetic expression. So every 40 seconds, every gene pair in your body changes or adapts to your environment based on the food you consume, the thoughts you think, the books you've read, the people you hang around. That's why the whole saying is, you're the sum total of the five people you hang around with all day long, because also through this epigenetic exchange, it happens through light. And even though you can't see the light that's emanating from me, and I can't see the light emanating from you as much as I can see you, the reason I see you is you're emanating light. But every cell of your body has something called mitochondria. Think of mitochondria as the energy, the, the power plant of the cell. And its its whole job is to absorb energy and transmit energy. It also has something to do with your metabolism. But while it's pulsa, pulsating that light, every cell is like our sun, like a pulsing star. It's actually broadcasting light energy to our genetics and telling our body what to do. That's what's changing every 40 seconds. So as you now you can downregulate that stress downregulates your mitochondrial function, which means the energy in your body goes down. That's why when people say I'm so stressed, I'm so tired. Most people don't go, I'm so energized. I'm so happy. I got to go to sleep. You know, it doesn't happen, right? Because energy flows where attention yeah. goes. So as you think about th this, we are a product of our environment internally as well as externally mm -hmm. so we're, it's always changing all the time and i think that as we when we think about peace of mind or peace in the world a lot of people don't realize that we are energy beings at the very core so when we do things that are energizing you know when we think of all the negative emotional states all negative things that are happening around the world those take our energy there's it's like an energy vampire you know if, if you watch too much news right before you go to sleep you're going to not sleep as well because your brain's trying to figure out how can i solve this problem i always recommend like watch your news earlier in the day so that you you stay informed, but don't do it right before bed because your your brain is going to st dream about that. We've all had the experience where we fall asleep watching a military movie maybe, and then we find ourselves in our dreams in that military show, you know, in, even though we didn't intend to, but the subconscious, that's the way it works. It absorbs what we have experienced the day. Its whole job is to process, organize, and then put into the future what we need to utilize for future experiences. And it doesn't know the difference between real or imagined. So our energy system is very important, like the books we read, the people we hang out with, the foods we consume. These all play a role into really peace of mind. What, what is our brain thinking about and in, in it's bringing about in our life experience? It's so interesting that you talk about this because you think that on any given day, how many times does 40 seconds occur? And that if we have a bad habit that we want to release, like negative energy of other people, time energy vampires, which we have multiple in our lives, <laughs> and making that choice of what we think of, who we're with, the self-love, the breathing, it could really make a big shift in someone's life. 
Exactly. You know, that's why I always say, you know, also it's important to realize that there is an infinite amount of energy. So no one can really rob you of your energy. They can they can take a little bit at a time, you know, and we all know those people that, you know, you get them on the phone, you go, oh, no, should I take this call? Or maybe you only answered every three times they call or something like that. Because you know it's going to be an investment, right? An investment of time and energy. But the reality is that we've got to take care of ourselves first. You know, just like the old airplane analogy, you know, you got to put the air, you got to put the air mask on mm -hmm. first. That's that's why I always tell people when the morning, when the day, you know, and I, I spend a couple hours every morning when somebody comes to my house. I a lot of friends. I have a, a game room, but it's mostly a health optimization room because it's got all my health toys in there, like my infrared sauna, my my vibration sound machine, my PMF machine, all those things. And they, they go, when do you have time to do this? I said, I get up every every morning, two hours before I talk to anybody else. I take care of myself. You know, I'm I'm now 62 and I plan on being around for my grandkids and their grandkids, hopefully. But it's only going to happen if I invest the time and the energy into it. It's not going to happen by accident. You know, you've, you've got to invest that time into doing it. Yeah, we have to invite ourselves to be conscious, breathing. And also when you talk about someone calling you and only answer every third time, I, I use this analogy and thought process. When I get off the phone with somebody or if I've met a friend for dinner or movie or whatever, I always uh, try to remember to analyze my inner feeling when I leave that person. Do you feel enlivened? Do you feel energized? Do you feel loved and supported? Or do you feel completely drained? And I can't wait to go to bed. So mm -hmm. I think that's a really good indicator that we can look at as as. Uh, maybe spending less time with that person or if they're not glued to the family like a relative because it's kind of hard to say okay yeah. you know whomever whomever can't talk to you anymore but th it begins the self-awareness to begin the dialogue to get that to the next step so you live and surround yourself with wonderful healthy people yeah. I still remember my dad when I was younger and I wrote about it in my book Awaken the Genius where he I had a friend Charlie and he's a great friend but he was not a good influence. And my dad said, I'm not going to tell you not to hang around with Charlie. What I want you to do is figure out all the things. And he had me read a book called As a Man Thinketh, which I think everybody should read. There's also one As a Woman Thinketh now. <laughs> you know, they, <laughs> well, that's good because so, so women like, do think yeah. a lot. <laughs> yes, yes. And but basically, he had me read that. And then I had to set goals and do those things. He said, if you start doing the things that are going to help you to accomplish your goals, those people will just not be around. You won't have to think about getting rid of them. And I still remember standing in line in, in the uh, football field, getting my diploma in high school and Charlie racing down the side street on his motorcycle, doing a little wheelie because he didn't graduate. Wow. And I thought, when's the last time I saw Charlie? And it had probably been six or seven months. And he just lived around the corner. But my life took a turn because I started focusing on and I became a three sport captain, you know, in, in sports and all of this and, and was an honor roll student. And I just started focusing. So don't worry about who you're going to be with or not be with. Do the things you love and find, you know, find the people that love doing those things. And you won't have to worry about missing Thank out you. on those. people. And then who knows, you might be the inspiration for that person to, to become more positive, more productive and more motivated. What's that expression? The tide always rises. So if you get your vibration up to a certain level, you might see your friends drop off, but new friends that are at that level, or as you said, you become the inspiration for someone to rise their level, and then mm -hmm. you can proceed accordingly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I always say, and I told this to my kids too, is just, just, just focus on what you can do. Mm -hmm. So many people give away their energy by trying to change it. We all have that family member that we'd all love to change. And I still remember I was in Barbados once and I was doing, I was leading this seminar and we used to do this thing where you would visualize a person in the chair being light as a feather and we'd bring up three small people and they would lift them up in the air like they do at Girl Scout camp. That's where I got it from, from my, from my daughter. And, and, <laughs> I remember uh, those days. <laughs> yeah. And what was so funny was they went to do the breathing exercises. They went to lift the person up. They couldn't budge him. And I'd never seen that happen before. And I went, wait a minute, what's going on? And the person sitting in the chair goes, oh, I'm an Aikido master. I anchored myself to the ground. And I said, this is a perfect example. I said, doesn't matter how much this whole room is visualizing this person light as a feather. If they don't want to change, they're not going to. I said, would you be willing to play a part in this? I said, 
would you imagine yourself light as a feather? And they almost threw him through the ceiling. Wow. And because once he, you, that person has to want to change. So you can do everything you can, but don't give away all your power trying to change another person. Spend, spend your time and energy changing within yourself and you'll find that other people will just change around you and you'll, su you'll support them. But it, I mean, I, I, so many times I've wanted to, you know, shake somebody awake, but you really can't do that. You can, you can, the old saying, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. You know, I would recommend books. I would recommend sessions. Now I just recommend my app. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know exactly. one of our most popular sessions, which is kind of amazing on brain tap is eliminate negative thinking. Now, I don't think people would say that out loud, right? They wouldn't say that to another person, but when they get the app and they can do it in the privacy of their own home, now they can work on their own inner feelings and they don't have to express it to anybody else. And that's one of the nice things about technology today is that we can, there's so many tools we can use from home or from our offices where we don't have to, you know, disclose that information, you know, growing up Catholic, you know what I mean? You know, you have to go to confession every Saturday and sometimes I'd have to make stuff up because I couldn't figure out what I did wrong. <laughs> but here I am I've got to do it you know, you know, so. I, I'm I'm guilty of that <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like what do I say I fought with my brothers again you know <laughs> yeah yeah wow that's really interesting um so you talked about your book let's talk about the book that came out in 1994 and it's been translated in four languages the 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 awaken the genius I love the title tell me what was that inspiration well the main thing was with me I was held back in second grade so my dad helped me. This is when he had me read the book and I had to start making goals and things like that. And he he basically, I believe that everyone is a genius. And in my research, I talk about, most people don't know what genius really means. They think it means Albert Einstein or Tesla or somebody like that. The word genius basically means it's from Roman mythology. And in Roman mythology, they said, we all have a genie and that genie houses our talents and skills. If we use those talents and skills, we're considered a genius, you know, so everyone has their own talents and skills. So I felt that I was an artist and I still am. I still do artwork and I, and now I'm more of a musical kind of artist with what I do with the app and things. But the reality is that we all have talents and skills and they, they say that God's gift to you is your talents and skills. Your gift to the world is how you use those talents and skills. And I think if we can wake up uh, the world, really, if we could have, my goal is to better a billion brains, because I believe if we had a billion people living their purpose, their God-given purpose, whatever that is, and whatever God, it doesn't matter to me, whatever their divine spark is, I believe everyone has this divine spark, and there's no coincidence, there's no happenstance, there's no accidents, you know, uh, even though my dad said when he was 32, he woke up and he had nine kids, you know, you don't really want to hear that when you're a kid, but I think that there's a there's a reason for everything, you know, like in Mark 10, I think it says all things work for good. I think everything is working for good. And but I think a lot of people, the frustration, the fear, the anxiety, the stress happens because we're trying to make sense out of something with our limited human mind. And the reality is that sometimes we just need to stop, relax, breathe, do some kind of mindfulness, you know get in tune with it because i think everything is the truth is everything is vibrating and teeming with energy and if we're out of sync with it we get anxious we get fearful we get angry but if we can just slow down if we get a billion people doing that there's something called the maharishi effect i don't know if you've read about that but what the maharishi did is he proved this in 41 different studies but i'm just going to tell you about one of them the one study was he went to washington dc and he said we're going to stop crime in washington dc we're going to lower it and they said, the, and we're going to lower it by a certain percentage. And I, I don't have it at the top of my head, but the, you can look up Maharishi effect and you can read about it. And they said, the only way that would happen is if we had a snowstorm and traffic stopped and nobody could get out. So they started their meditation. They had these meditators there and they were all meditating for peace in Washington, D.C. And they said the, the levels of crime went down. And then when they stopped meditating, it went right back up. They said, I think we need them there today. <laughs> And yeah, every yeah, day do. after. <laughs> yes, yeah. So that's why we need a billion people every day meditating in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, because we are in a crisis right now. Yeah. There's so much fear. There's so much anxiety. I mean, think about our news. They have to scour the whole planet to get us one hour of bad news. 
We need to start sharing the good news from our communities because I can tell you what, just in my community, I'm sure we'd have more than an hour to talk about good news that's happening today. But nobody talks about that because our propensity as humans, unfortunately, because of our genetic memories, wasn't long ago that we didn't live to be over 30 years old. Yes. You know, that's why when somebody says, why does, why do, why does our body seem to give out around 77, 80 years old? Well, longevity wasn't in our genes, you know, because we didn't live that long. Now we are. But the reality is that all the memories they now know as teeming is information inside of our genes is every memory of every ancestor that we had going back to the beginning of time. So we know that, you know, they, they did a study where they actually had duck eggs were being raised they basically they let the ducks uh, uh they they opened up there was no mother duck to teach them but the ducklings knew to waddle down to the water and swim how did they know to do that it's because it's part of their genetic imprint we have those genetic imprints so you know in, and i know that more than ever now because i've had two kids and my grandkids they're they both have different personalities just out of the box, you know, nobody taught them those things, just that's the way that they are. So once you know that, you can then not manipulate it, but you can work with it or you can retrain it because part of our biggest internal factor is that we have a fear factor. There's only two things that we're, we're born with. One is fear of falling and one is fear of loud noises. And the common denominator is fear. <laughs> we yes. have fear is, is baked into our consciousness to keep us alive. You know, in, we needed that, you know, 200,000 years ago. Today, you know, we have this fear of hunger, for instance. But I can walk in any direction and get a grocery store in less than 10 minutes. You know, so, but but we still have this fear of, uh, our body still has this fear of deprivation, of not having enough. And so we want to hoard things. You know, we're, we're, we're people that we don't just fill our homes up. We go buy storage units. And we fill those up. And then, and then we buy garages and we fill those up. And then you people know. buy out the toilet paper in the stores because yes. they're afraid it's not going to be manufactured. Right. <laughs> we yeah. saw that very so, I mean, close and personal in the last couple of years. Right. So when you think of this fear, as some people say, false evidence appearing real. But it, the, the reality is that it's just baked in that this is what motivates us. But the other motivator is. We can flip the switch. The motivator can be, hey, what can we do to make it better? Because some people are motivated by making the world better. Some people are motivated by fear. But we, there, there needs to be a balance there. You know, if it's totally fear all the time, then our really there's something called the psychoimmune system, which is we have a thinking immune system. And they know that people who look at life as a series of challenges have a much better functioning immune system than people who look at their life as a series of threats. You know, so we need to flip the switch. This is just a challenge right now that we're going through. We're going to get through it. Human race is going to get through it. And whatever, however it resolves, it's going to resolve. And we need to focus on the most positive we can, do what we can in our own communities. The, the one thing that, that most people are too overreaching or they want to talk about politics, which I think there's a time to talk about that with people. Not at home parties, but, but we talking about that, you know, or religion, right? Right. So those are two things that usually get a little conflict going. But the the reality is that we need to talk about what can we do to make more just equanimity. You know, where where how can we build the balance in our lives so that this fear, this frustration, this anxiety doesn't drive behavior? Because emotion drives behavior. So if we can manage our emotions, we can drive our behavior. If we can't drive our, if we can't control our emotions. I'm also a black belt in Taekwondo. And when I used to spar and kickbox, I knew if I could make somebody angry, I won. Mm. And, and so people think they get angry, they're going to get tougher. No, you get stupider. The, yes. the, the angrier you get, the more upset you get, the dumber you get. And that's just a fact of nature because when you become primitive, that, that primitive brain takes over and then you just become brutal. You know, what do they say? Uh, fighting is the refuse of the unskilled mind. So when you, when you think about in what's going on in our world, all this fighting and everything, it's not, that's not a solution. That's a bigger problem. You know, so we, we've got to focus on what can we do. And it all starts really in our own mind. That's why, you know, I'm part of a documentary we're creating with Daryl Olin and uh, Hunter Richards called War on the Brain. Because we have we have a war for our own mind right now. And, and we I need think to... once the individual, all of us individually take responsibility and have sovereignty within our own lives and have peace of mind, 
it encourages our relationships and our personal relationships and familial relationships and then community and then global relationships become more peaceful based. And I always heard the term like if you're in a, a, a conversation with someone that you care about and it starts to escalate, to really breathe and pull back because just as you said, the first person who yells has already automatic, automatically lost the fight right. because exactly. they've lost all all collective reasoning goes out reasoning. the window. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I was like reasoning. Um, I want to talk about brain tap. How did that inspire you? Where did, where, where did it come from? How long has it been in existence? Because, you know, we're, we're getting those self tools to be able to get that 1 billion people a day. Yeah. And yeah. I see it as being 8 billion people a day. Yes. I think, <laughs> yeah. I think big. Um, yeah. because then we can really, really change the world, right? So sure. the 1 billion, I'm going to stand with you and, and help create that. But tell us about the brain tap. And I, I believe right behind you. Is yeah, there's, the one, there's one back here. You can see it behind me. It's the It's got a visor. It's got earphones. And it also has an app. So if you can't afford the headset, you can download the app for free, actually. It's a 14-day trial. But what inspired me was, uh, first of all, was that I felt, what helped my dad you know if it helped my dad stop drinking and helped a family of nine not have any alcoholics you know uh then i knew there was something to it you have to change your mind you can't just give lip service to it so it's something you can do daily and it's all about really vibrational medicine because we're all vibrating teaming with energy just like you said the two arguments that happen and then the person that breathes they're going to become the resident frequency the other person's going to resonate to so you've got to become that resonance and so uh, how it happened was really uh, by divine appointment, really. I, I met the people in Vegas at an event. It just happened that the founder passed away that had a piece of equipment called the SILS, a sensory input learning system. And I happened to have an undergraduate degree in electronics. And I asked the people, where are you going to go after this? And this is a shorter version of the story. It's in a book called Miracles. But the um, uh, with the with uh, what happened was, they said, well, we're going to go visit family in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I just happened to have an office in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I met them in Vegas. I said, well, why don't you come by the office? Well, so we reverse engineered it. And we started building out. The first machine was called the MC Square. And we've had 15 other ones until we got the brain tap in 2013. When I was able to put it all together. Before that, it kind of looked like a stereo system stacked, you know, with different modules. But with electronics, we were able to shrink it down, put it all into one headset, make it really convenient. And we didn't have to have CDs or cassettes anymore or downloads. We could put it into an app. So now you can we can have a training process that people can use at home. And it really started for pain control. Because pain, for if you're out there in pain right now, pain only happens in one brainwave state. It's called beta. That's also where fear, anxiety, and frustration live. So if we can down-regulate that, that's why yoga like you did with your mother and things like that creates such inner peace. Because when you drop into that alpha and theta state, those are states of hypernesia, super memory, but they also create natural analgesia and GABA. And, and GABA is so important because this... Those are two uh, neurotransmitters that most people are missing today. When people say to me, oh, we have a mental health problem today, I'll say, no, we have a physiological health problem today yeah. because people are moving and breathing. You know, when you think about things like yoga or tai chi or dance, you know, it's very hard to be depressed and anxious when you're doing those things because you're moving and breathing. And I think most people sitting all day long, and they blame it on the screens, of course, but you're sitting and you're looking at the screen. So it's like a double whammy. You know, you, you we've got to be up and moving and breathing. And there's a whole, it's more than just that. I, I believe, number one, we needed to have a good diet. So my mother got us into nutrition, actually, first. And then we have to do some kind of moving and breathing, which got us into sports and things like that. And then number three, got us into the brain fitness, which was now brain tap. And I think that most people do not have the time, the energy, or the effort to want to learn how to meditate or relax or even say their prayers or whatever. So when I we found out something called frequency follow and response, again, back to that mirror neuron effect in the brain, we know there's a science that if we, do, if we present a certain frequency of light, a certain frequency of sound, the brain is going to follow that frequency. We can imitate a cycle of sleep, or we can imitate going to the beach. We can imitate going to the mountains. And even though we're not physically there, 
the subconscious does not know the difference between real or imagined. So, for instance, when we go to the ocean, a lot of people go, oh, I love the ocean. I just love sitting there watching the waves and all of that. Well, that's because water, a body of water has a evoked potential like that candle I was talking about earlier. It has a 10 hertz frequency response, which means it's creating acetylcholine, that feel-good neurotransmitter, just sitting there. If we go to the mountaintop, and I'll put it into a story so they understand when I... Last year, I was voted uh, Research of the Year in India with a group out of Bhopal, India, Ames, Bhopal. And, but when I first met them, I thought I was crazy, right? Because this is meditating capital of the world, right? Everybody thinks everybody meditates in, in India, but they don't. It's a small group of people that do. And so Varun, Dr. Varun says, you know, Dr. Porter, you're cheating because these gurus spend their whole lifetime learning how to meditate. And I took somebody on stage and I imitated the same brainwave as a guru, but with somebody who had never meditated. And we did it in 10 minutes. And he goes, how did you do that? I said, he goes, you're cheating. And I said, well, not really. He goes, he goes, what do you mean? I said, Varun, have you ever meditated to a candle? He said, oh yeah, we do that all the time. We call it a jyoti meditation. And I said, well, you know, that's cheating. He goes, what do you mean? I said, that candle's flickering at 10 hertz frequency. Just like a, if you've ever been on a romantic getaway and you've had a, a fire burning and you start to get a little frisky, that's because acetylcholine is the feel-good, fall-in-love kind of neurotransmitter. So when you're there, it sets the mood. You get high in your own supply because the fire is flickering at 10 hertz frequency. and doesn't. I, I just have to say, get high on your own supply. That's a good t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when you're there. Free so and said, peaceful. <laughs> yeah. And I said, that's cheating. And I said, have you ever wondered why the, they always show the picture of the gurus in the Himalayas and they go to the mountains in the Himalayas and meditate? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, that's cheating. He goes, what do you mean? I said, the, the mountains themselves are an isochronic tone generator. The Earth itself is an isochronic tone generator, meaning that if you and I were to fly to space and go to the Earth, it would resonate between 0 0.5 and 100. Now, our brain has an evoked potential of 0 0.5 to 100, which means wherever we're at on the planet, our brain will sink to its environment. So the mountains are 7.8. That happens to be theta. When you, when you evoke a theta brainwave in abundance, you create GABA. GABA is a precursor to DMT. And if you're anybody out there has ever t talked about psychedelics or read about them, DMT is called the God molecule because when people experience an overabundance of that in their system, they will have a spiritual experience. This is our body doing it. So our body can create, every cell of your body actually has DMT molecules. They're just not in overabundance. So we don't always have that spiritual connection or that spiritual experience, but we can create it when we start to meditate and start to get mm. in tune because it's our natural state. It's our, it's our normal state. The farther we get away from theta into beta, fear, frustration, and anxiety, the less we are in touch with or in tune with our true nature. So what I wanted to do is when, when I did it, it worked so well for me. And I said, we need to do this for everybody. And then I started a franchise company. I sold that in 2002. And I thought I was just going to be speaking and doing my thing out there. But then in, in 2012, when the company went out of business that I sold my company to, I got back all my rights and everything. And so I created BrainTap, which is good for the world, because now we're in all these different countries doing all these wonderful things. And I think the, the world needs it because it, it, in the past, you had to go to one of my franchises to, to experience it. So now it's available to anybody anywhere in the world. And that's going to increase your billion person goal. Do you, yeah. um, do you tap into the Ayurvedics at all because of the Alpha Theta Beta? I'm sorry, do you tap into the Ayurveda Ayurvedics? I'm not sure what that is. Never oh, it might that. be something you might want to look into because it has the alpha, theta, beta. It even oh. taps into how you can um, determine what kind of a personality you are. Like betas are more of the stockier people, more slow moving. And then it goes all the way up to the alphas that are very highly energetic. Um, oh. I had somebody many, many years ago share that with me. And for some reason, I have kind of this odd combination of all three of them. They said not very oh, many people have this. Think. So it might be something to look into um, yeah. how it interlaces with the brain tap. So mm -hmm. um, you have over 3 million self-help products sold worldwide. What date would that, did that come into? I mean, is it more that's than... A, that's actually million? an old number because we... we I had a know, feeling. <laughs> but the... Uh, Back in the back in the old days when we used to sell hard copy CDs and cassettes, 
uh, that was probably between um, somewhere around 1998 to 2010 is when that number happened. But now we have a, almost uh, 125,000 listenings on our app a day now, and it's expanding. I mean, the nice thing is our average user uses our app 28 times a month. So they're getting some kind of benefit from it. And we only have about anywhere between 1% to 3% of our people ever quit using our app. So they're getting a value out of it. And we can get uh, yeah. it on the App Store, correct? Yes. Yeah. They just look up BrainTap and they'll see it there. And they'll see the little picture of the brain. And that's the, uh, the, the that's my BrainTap app. And, you know, we, we just find that, you know, it's something that you don't have to think about. You can just press, I, I like to tell people, press play to change. You know, and it, we're only really talking about changing your state because a lot of these addictions that are out there, I used to be an addiction therapist. I wrote programs for the state of Arizona for DUIs back in the early days of my uh, professional life. And what I realized was that people weren't getting high to get out of their body or whatever. They were getting high to try to get normal. And th they, they thought they could do it through alcohol or drugs or whatever. But the reality is that the most powerful pharmacy is not in the corner drugstore. The most powerful pharmacy on earth is between our ears. It can dispense 30,000 different neurochemicals with the right thought. So I let's think the right thoughts and get that going. Yeah, let's, let's do that. That's the drug of choice is self-love and tapping into your brain and all the powerful magic that can come from it. Um, what do you recommend to people to have the next steps of getting more on board with inner peace? In addition to, of course, going to the app store and downloading the BrainTap app and the beautiful product lines behind you, what if uh, what would you say? I think the biggest, the first thing most people need to do is learn to forgive. And the word forgive means to give before, not mm -hmm. to wait for somebody to say they're sorry. You know, a lot of times they're carrying this hurt from childhood and that person that hurt them or harmed them is no longer in their life. They might even be passed away. You know, but they're still letting them control their emotional well-being. So forgiveness is most important. So most importantly, forgive yourself for carrying that baggage with you and then forgive that other person because they did the best they could. Maybe not the best they're capable of. That's the, the, the difference between the best they could and the best they're capable of are very different. You know, people are can be very cruel. And, yes. you know, you, you've kind of got to be sorry for them. When, when Buddha said, he who angers you conquers you, what he meant was that anger goes through you first. So yes. when you are angry, upset, and irritated about somebody else, they don't feel it as much as you do. I did a, um, I did a research project with Whole Health. It was a heartfelt meditation out of India. We had 75,000 people at the event, and we recorded through biologics, what happens to the person meditating, what they would do is they would meditate and they would send healing energy from their heart to another person. So we had the two people hooked up to mm -hmm. see what would happen. And what they were amazed, I wasn't amazed, I knew this was going to happen. The person who was projecting the love and healing to the other person actually got more benefit than the person receiving it. So when Jesus said, love your enemy, that you should pray for them, forgive them, but send them healing, loving energy. So anybody you're mad about or upset about, first of all, forgive yourself for carrying that. Forgive them for whatever harm they did to you. They did the best they could, not the best they're capable of. But then take some time to send healing, loving energy to them. You will be paid back multifold because now you're going to liberate your mind. Your mind will then learn that it's not worth your energy. What I tell people is they're not worth your time and energy anymore. Send them healing energy. They need it worse than you do. But what the nice thing is, the more you give away of love, the more you, the way you give away of this energy, the more you get back. It's there's an endless, there's an infinite supply. But if we try to hoard it or we try to stay angry, and we now know that this energy field that during during COVID they actually did an experiment. People who are in states of love, peace, and harmony actually were their mitochondria was transmitting 200 times more light. You know, in, in, in the skin industry, they now call it luminescence, right? Somebody's like when somebody's pregnant, they go, you're glowing. Well, the reality is they are glowing. They're, they're, they're projecting healing energy. We, we have a luminescence around us. And people who are in a state of fear and anxiety and frustration, they were, remember, 200 times less energy. So the more energy we can project, the more health we're going to have, the more healing we're going to have, the better we're going to help our 
family, our friends, our coworkers, like you said, our community and our, our city, our state, whatever. It, and so basically those are two things I would recommend, you know, forgiveness first, love everybody else second. You know, and then once you've forgiven everybody, if that if that's capable of happening, now you can just send love, send love and healing. But you got to heal yourself because that all that anger, all that fear, all that hurt is going to prevent you. It's like a, having a, a pane of glass that has cracks in it. You're not going to see the true light from the sun. We need to fix that crystal. And you're the crystal. You know, your body, think of it like a crystal energy. And we need to heal it. And you can't get even. You're never going to, unless you have a time machine. And then if you do call me up, because there's some things I'd like to go back in time and change. But if you, <laughs> you know, we, we have to move forward and we have to release the past. The old saying, the past is behind you. The future is before you, but your power is right here, right now. You have the power to be happy in this moment. And you do that by being of service. So the more you can think of serving others, and there's actually a psychological benefit. They, they write about it in many books. That when people go, why do all these people that have the, all this money, they don't have to do anything, why do they want to go out and serve people? Because they get an emotional payoff. Because that we're natural naturally, we're supposed to be caring for each other. That's the way our bodies are designed, our physiology is designed, our psychology is designed. But when we try to hoard things or, you know, like the miser, like we're going into the Scrooge season, right? So, you know, there's a there's a big difference. We, you know, we want to be the giving person, not giving to the point that you don't have for yourself, but you want to be able to, you know, give things that are free to you, like your energy, you know, your your love, your compassion. You know, that's why a lot of the studies in meditation, they do them on compassion, you know, being in being in compassion. You know, we we can't change the world, but we can change ourselves. And by doing that, we have changed the world. I love that. This is so important for our viewers to hear that right now we are in a transformation in the world and it's really about self-love. So those of you out there that are listening to Dr. Patrick Porter, um, download the app go get the tools if you can afford them and do things that are for free which is forgiving ourselves loving ourselves forgiving our neighbors forgiving those who trespass against us mm -hmm. as an old <laughs> prayer that comes yeah. to mind and um just be out there in the world for love and light so thank you for joining us today i'm so honored to be here with you and to learn more about you and i look forward to all the future adventures that we're planning together to be able to help heal people and bring peace of mind and peace of heart well thank you for having me and anybody listening remember you're valued and you're needed in this this equation Absolutely. every person helps. the goal is one billion but i say let's go for eight billion that's right <laughs> let's do it thank you all and we'll be right back